<laughs> All right, good morning, gang. Let's see, it looks like folks are still getting here, so. There we go. Do -do -do. So today is your guys' day. We can do whatever you'd like to do to prepare. I imagine that means we'd like to solve let me turn this off for one second. I imagine that means we would like to solve some problems, presumably. From the homework or from the study guide. So what would you guys like to look at? You can type into the chat. You know, homework five, problem this. So let me go ahead and get the study guide pulled up. What do I not have? Oh, that's right, because I had to start after installing those drivers. OK. OK. Let's keep those coming in, because ideally, I'd like to do them in the order that they um, that they live in the homework because those concepts kind of progress and build one on top of the other. If there are any questions from before the study guide, I'd like to do those before getting to the study guide questions. Number four from homework three was requested. I'm going to begin there. Number four. Because this is an inverse function, sine inverse, arctan, cosine inverse natural logs, all of those functions which are defined to be the inverse of some other function. We saw how to integrate all of those back when we were learning integration by parts. So the inverse cosine function, this is something we're going to attack with IBP. Which means we need to choose U and DV. Um, and thankfully, this like most integration by parts problems, we can use our LIPET rule to help us choose. I don't have any logarithms, but I do have an inverse function, which means I'm going to pick that to be u and everything else to be dv. Now, the derivative of the inverse cosine function is the negative of the derivative of the inverse sine function. And the integral of dx is just x. So here's what my little IVP table looks like. Uh, 
And then if we then if we follow the integration part parts formula of the integral of u dv should be equal to u times v minus the integral of v times du. So this guy should be equal to, I'll write the x out front because it looks a little better times the inverse cosine of x minus the integral of v times du. I think it's a good thing that we're reaching back a little bit because these are things that people have had some time to forget. So my next move would be to just uh, play around algebraically inside the integral a little bit. I'll leave the x cos inverse x alone. Change the minus minus to a plus. Um, and then I think this is probably the easiest way to, to think about that integral because the move in, in the remaining integral there is going to be to do, oh, she twisted this. It's gonna to be to do some u substitution. Uh, so from here, uh, make the substitution z equals one minus x squared. dz there is negative two x dx. So this is x times the inverse cosine of x minus one half, and the minus one half is coming from the differential because negative one half dz is x dx times the integral of one over the square root of z dz. And then this, the x cos x, or x cos inverse x, sorry, comes along for the ride, minus one half integral z to the negative one half power is what one over the square root of z is. And when I integrate z to the negative one half power, I'll get z to the one half divided by one half When I divide by the one half, the one halves will cancel. So I'll just get the square root of z or z to the positive one half. And then finally, going back to my original variable, I get this. Okay, so we've got one from homework two there. Let's reach back to homework two. I think these would be volume problems then. Oh, the Taurus, yeah. Okay, I remember this one. I don't need to write this down. So this was homework three, question four. The next one we're gonna look at was uh, homework two, question 12. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a few things here. I'm gonna show you how to set up the integral and then I'm going to show you a much faster way to find that volume. So in homework two, you are asked to find the volume of the torus using the method of cylindrical shells. Let's see if I can draw a decent torus here. There she is. So we're told that the radius of the circular cross section here is little r. And then this radius is big R. And we wanted to find the volume.
using cylindrical shells. So first, let me show you the fast way. The fast way to find the volume of this torus, if you use your intuition. Think of this as like a rubbery donut, a donut that you can move around, um, a donut that you can like squish and stretch and deflect. Um, I'm going to move it in ways that don't change the volume. In particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine bringing a knife right through this circle, chopping it. If I chop it and unroll it, then I'll get like a tube. That's like that. And this is like this. And here the little radius. And this is like the circumference of, of the torus all the way around. So that's 2 pi times capital R. Uh, and now this is just a cylinder, right? So you take the cross-sectional area and you multiply it by the length. So the volume, we don't even need any integration if we do it like this. The volume is pi times little r squared. times this length, which is 2 pi r, 2 pi times capital R. So you get 2 pi squared little r squared big R. That's the fast way to find the volume. But the question here asks you to do this using the method of cylindrical shells. Um, and I remember working this problem. It's a doozy to do with cylindrical shells. It's not terribly hard to set up the integral, but then the integral itself has a piece that looks like it requires trig sub. And at the time, you guys didn't even know what trig sub was. So certainly you weren't about to do that. So what I'm gonna do here is show you a way to interpret the hard part of the resulting integral from cylindrical shells geometrically, not as this volume, but as something else that you know. Uh, and that will allow you to resolve the shells integral. So or by cylindrical shells. I always forget whether there's two L's there in cylinder or not. What we need to do in order to see this as a cylindrical shells problem <clears throat> is to get this solid as a solid of revolution, right? It has to come from revolving some region about some axis. And that's not terribly hard. If you think about it, Think about it a little bit, you'll realize that the torus comes from revolving a circle of radius little r that is centered a distance big r away from some axis about that axis. So if I put the center of the circle here at capital R comma zero and I revolve around the y-axis, this will generate the torus, right? If this is my region, that I'm revolving, and I rotate it about this axis, about the y-axis, as long as I'm centered cap r away over here, and the radius of this little circle is little r, that will generate this object. So then the question is, how do I set this up as a shells problem from here? It's not too bad. I need the equation for this guy though. So remember that the equation of a circle centered at a comma b of radius 
R is Y minus B squared plus X minus A squared equals R squared. So this circle has equation y squared plus x minus cap r squared equals little r squared. And we can solve that for y. And what you really get here, when you take that plus and minus from the square root, you solve for y, you're getting the equation of the upper semicircle, that's the plus, and the equation of the lower semicircle, that's the minus. So I'm gonna redraw this picture with room for me to come in and label things. Forgive my bad art. Since I'm using the shells method, I'll draw my strip parallel to the axis of rotation. Looking like this. The point up here is x comma, the positive version of the square root. And the point down here is x comma, the negative version of that square root. So the height is this, and the radius for my shell's problem is this. I don't want to label the radius as r because I don't want to confuse things. Um, we already have two r symbols floating around, so I don't even have a free instance of the symbol r to use. Um, but this distance right here, the thing that is the radius of my cylindrical shell, that's x, because the x coordinate here is x, the x coordinate here is zero. And h is this y value minus this y value. Well, that's this minus this negative, that's two copies of the square root of little r squared minus x minus big r squared. So I've got my radius and I've got my height, which means that dv is two pi times the radius x times the height. times the thickness of the strip there. X minus R squared. Okay. Okay. So V is going to be the integral from whatever this x value is to whatever this x value is of dv.
the x value here, remember the center point is capital R. Let me bring this back down. Remember the center point is capital R comma zero. So this point right here is capital R minus little r comma zero. And this point right here is capital R plus little r comma zero. So I'm gonna integrate from big R minus little r to big R plus little r dv. which is the integral from big R minus little r to big R plus little r, two pi x, oh, I should say four pi x, I'll just write it like this for now, times two times the square root of little r squared minus x minus big R squared. Dx. So if you got this far on this problem, um, you would be forgiven for stopping here and calling it a day. Totally understand. But it's not impossible to proceed from here. It's just not easy. I'll pop out my constants. So I've got a two and a two pi, so I can bring out a four pi. Integral from cap r minus little r to cap r plus little r. X times this square root. And I remember sitting and playing with this integral for a minute going, you know what? I'm not sure you can do this without trig sub. At first glance, I was thinking, oh, well, this x will allow me to substitute for the quadratic portion under the square root, and it's just a straight u sub integral, but that's not true. No matter how you try and make that happen, you're going to end up with a little piece that does look inevitably trig subby. And here is the best answer I found, or I was able to come up with, that is appropriate for the Calc 2 level without knowing trig sub. Now at this point in the class right now, you guys do know trig sub, you could do this. Uh, you could do this integral directly. But first you may want to make the substitution and this is also how we, how we get it done without trig sub, z equals x minus r. dz is just dx, it's an easy substitution to make happen. Your bounds are gonna change, your lower bound, cap r minus little r, if x is equal to cap r minus little r, then z is equal to cap r minus little r minus cap r, which is just minus little r. And similarly, cap r plus little r goes to plus little r. We'll have four pi integral minus little r to plus little r. This x is now going to be z plus r. And this square root is now going to be little r squared minus z squared and dx is dz. And you might be saying, well, John, this still looks like trig sub, and you're right about part of it. I can distribute the z minus r, split the integral up into two pieces. One of those pieces can be handled as a trigonometric substitution if you wanted to, but another one can be handled by u sub. And the piece that appears to be trig subby can actually be done a different way. So here first is the u sub piece. I'll have z times my square root of r squared minus z squared dz. This is an integral that we did back in section 5.5. This is a u sub problem. And then we would have plus 4 pi r integral little negative little r to big 
uh, positive little r, square root of little r squared minus z squared. This is the piece that appears to be only doable by a trig sum. But that's not the case. So just to be clear, this piece is not too bad. This piece is a, another regular u sub or z sub. This piece, if you were jumping in using analytic methods only, would require trig sub. But there's a way to interpret this integral geometrically that will save you from the substitution. And I think that's what the author of the textbook intended. If you go back to your Calc 1 problems, if you go back to section 5.1, where you introduce the definite integral, they gave you integrals like this and said, evaluate the integral by drawing a picture and then using geometry to figure out the area that the integral represents. That will get you through this one. This one's going to be a u sub. So here u is r squared minus z squared du is negative 2 dz. My bounds will change. When u is equal to negative little r, I'm sorry, when z is equal to negative little r, u will be r squared minus negative r squared. So here, I'll write it out because it's a little complicated. z equals negative r leads to u equals little r squared minus negative little r squared. And when z is equal to positive little r, u is equal to r squared minus r squared. Both of these, let's see, what do we get here? They shouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. So up here, when I plug in r for z, I get r squared minus r squared. Uh, that's looking like zero, isn't it? Oh, this is zero. Yeah. Both of these are zero. OK. Over here, I have to think of, so this first piece becomes the integral from zero to zero. That integral is going to be zero. This piece, we have to interpret this geometrically. As an area. Right, it's an integral, it's a definite integral, so it's an area. It's the area under this curve. Um, z equals negative r to z equals positive r. The graph of f of z equals r squared minus z squared, that's an upper semicircle centered at the origin. Holy shit. All right, it's an upper semicircle, <laughs> take my word on it, centered at the origin. The radius is little r. So that area is what this integral is computing, which is half the area of the circle of radius little r. That's 1 half times pi r squared. And this first guy, he becomes 4 pi integral 0 to 0. z dz is negative 1 half du. So I'll put my negative 1 half right here. 
you have the square root of u du, but since I'm integrating from zero to zero, this piece is zero. So all together, <clears throat> I get zero plus four pi cap r times one half pi little r squared. So all together, v is equal to four pi times zero plus four pi cap r times one half pi little r squared. Four times one half is two, pi times pi is pi squared, little r squared cap r, which is what we found when we did this the easy way. So this is correct. Um, I agree that this is not an easy problem. I think one person brought this by my office hours and then one other person emailed me about it and probably pretty much everybody else put it into symbol lab or something and didn't tell me, um, which is a little bit disheartening, but uh, also a little bit understandable. It's a hard problem. Um, back when we were working this in section 6.3, you should have been able to get to here. If you got to here and then gave up, I understand. But we should have been able to get to here because this isn't terribly hard, right? This was a fairly straightforward cylindrical shell setup. You had to understand the torus as a solid of revolution, understand that the torus comes from revolving, revolving this circle about this axis. And then the shell setup isn't bad. You draw your strip in parallel to the axis of rotation, find the height and find the radius. There's a little bit of symbol juggling that goes on because you've got the symbols cap R and little r already being used for something else. Um, but coming up with the volume any possible way is not hard, right? This is very easy. Coming up with the cylindrical shells integral for this problem, a little bit harder, but a fair problem. Evaluating that integral, admittedly very hard at this level. The trick <clears throat> again, was to make this substitution, transforming the original shell's integral into this integral, then distributing this piece across this piece, splitting up the integral. One is doable via a u sub, and it turns out to be zero. The other one requires a geometric interpretation, uh, which you know, is not really what we do a lot of in Calc 2. In Calc 2, for the most part, we're teaching you analytic methods. And it's, it's understandable if, if you looked at this integral and said, how the fuck do I do this? There's no way I can do this. Um, because we didn't know trig sub at the time. But of course, now you could dive in. You could dive in all the way back here and do the trigonometric substitution x minus cap r equals little r sine theta. I don't wanna burn any more time on this problem today. Um, so I'm not gonna go back and do that trig sub uh, because you didn't know trig sub at the time this problem was assigned. So let's move to the next problem that was requested. I think I saw something from homework three. Yeah, number 11 from homework three. Number four on homework three. We did 11 on three and then 12 from two that okay so 11 from three I don't believe we've done yet integral zero to two pi x sine x cos x I like this integral because there's a bunch of different ways you can approach it. You've got a product of three different functions there. 
So your brain should start leaning towards integration by parts, especially when you notice that you've got a polynomial function times some trig stuff. <clears throat> if I were to follow the Lipet rule, logs no, inverse functions no, polynomial function, yeah, then I should run IBP right away with this equal to u and everything else equal to dv. But the dv to v step would require integrating sine x times cos x, which is a little bit of work. Uh, that integral you did three different ways in section 7.2, recall. You can do it with a u sub, actually you can do it with two different u subs, and you can do it with a trig identity. My favorite way to get this knocked out is to begin with the trig identity sine 2x equals 2 sine x cos x. Because I have in my integrand a sine x times cos x. And so according to this double angle identity for sine, sine x cos x is the same as 1 half sine of 2x. So that's where I would get started here. I would use that identity to rewrite this integral as integral 0 to 2 pi x times 1 half sine of 2x dx. And now I would run some integration by parts. Following the Lipet rule, I'm going to let u be x and dv be 1 half sine of 2x dx. So then du is just dx and v is the integral of 1 half sine 2x. Um, that is the negative of cos 2x over 4. Here's my IBP. And now I'm ready to jump into my integral. This integral is equal to u times v So I'll write that as negative x cos 2x over 4. <clears throat> And that piece gets evaluated from 0 to 2 pi minus the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Remember, when you're doing integration by parts on a definite integral, you always need to evaluate the u times v piece. And the integral that's output is always going to be between those bounds as well. Uh, and then my v times du is just negative cos 2x over 4 dx. Before proceeding, we should evaluate this chunk. That way we don't have to keep writing it again and again. When I plug in 0, the x here will make everything 0. When I plug in 2 pi, I'll have negative 2 pi times the cosine of 4 pi. The cosine of 4 pi is 1. So this is negative 2 pi over 4. And then minus minus here makes plus 1 fourth integral 0 to 2 pi cosine of 2x. And then the integral of cos 2x, that's not terribly hard. That's one of these micro u subs. So I have negative 2 pi over 4. Uh, we can just write that as negative pi over 2. And then plus 1 fourth sine 
2x over 2 evaluated between 0 and 2 pi. So I get negative pi over 2 plus 1 fourth times here. <clears throat> At both of these endpoints, sine of 2x is 0. All right, the sine of 4 pi is 0, and the sine of 0 is 0. So this piece contributes nothing, and I just get negative pi over 2. And that's it. Not too bad. Uh, so this is definitely an integration by parts problem, but because it involves the, those trig functions, um, it's useful to, to use this trig identity as well. Um, other ways you could handle this, you'd use the same sort of thing. You'd do IBP with this as U and this as DV. And then for your DV to V step to go from here to here, if you didn't rewrite this as one half sine two X, you would need to do either a little U sub or um, I guess a, a tiny little IBP within your IBP. I don't recommend that things can get cluttered there. Um, but this is, I'm, I'm certain the cleanest way to get it done. Any questions on this one? Okay. So that leaves number two from the study guide. Oh, really? Okay. So this, this could be done a number of different ways. I don't want to solve the exact problem that's there because again, the idea of the study guide is for me to see what you know and how you work it before the test. And if I solve the exact problem here, people will just write down what I write down. So I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to find the volume blah blah blah. Here I'll use y equals uh, x to the fifth, y equals zero, x equals zero, and we'll rotate about the line x equals uh, one. So y equals x to the fifth looks very similar to y equals 27x cubed. It's a flattened down version of, of that sort of polynomial shape. Nice on this side. Like, <clears throat> like this on this side. Y equals zero is the x-axis. X equals zero is the y-axis. Um, oh, was there another curve there? Let's see. Zero, x equals one. About x equals two. Okay. So let's, we'll do x equals one and then about x equals three. We'll do it like that. So here's x equals one. Remember x equals a constant is always a vertical line. And then we'll say over here is x equals three. So the key to all these volume problems is drawing a good picture. Your graphing skills have to be there. So my region is this region. And we can attack this two different ways. We can attack this using the shells method or using the disk washer method. 
because everything is given to me as a function of x, in particular this curve, y equals x to the fifth, is given to me as a function of x, I would like to use whichever method will allow me to set up a dx integral. So, which method should I use? Cylindrical shells or disk washer? Anybody besides Margaret have a guess? I'd just like to get a feel for how comfortable everybody else is. So if I want to do a dx integral, my strip needs to go in up and down, right? That way its thickness is a dx thickness. Since my axis of rotation is a vertical line, the strip going in up and down would mean drawing the strip parallel to that axis of rotation, which would mean using the shells method. And if I wanted to use the disk washer method, then I would draw my strip in perpendicular to the axis of rotation like this blue box. And because I want to do a dx integral, I would use the shells method. So my strip would look like this. You could use the disk washer method on this. And everything would have to be done with respect to y. The height is here, and the radius is the distance always from the axis of rotation to the strip. So my little differential solid would look like this. So here's my little cylindrical shell. The height is h and the radius we've labeled as r. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing the, the disk washer method here. It's just, I think, a little bit harder. It just takes a little bit more time. So remember, if we cut and unroll this guy, we can find that the volume of that cylindrical shell is 2 pi rh dx, because the thickness of this wall here is dx. I need to find h and r next. To find h, I characterize this point along the curve, y equals x to the fifth. It is x comma x to the five, because the graph y equals f of x is always the points x comma f of x, which means that the height here is the y value at the top of the strip minus the y value at the bottom of the strip. The bottom of the strip rests on the x axis, so the y value there is zero. So h is x to the five minus zero, or just x to the five. What is R? <clears throat> Very good, three minus X. We take the X value here and we subtract the X value over here to find this horizontal distance. The X value here is three because this is the line X equals three. 
the x value over here is just x. So this is three minus x. So then v will be the integral of dv. And I'm gonna integrate from where to where. Very good, from zero to one. The smallest x value in my region is zero and the largest x value in my region is one. In other words, if you imagine this strip as moving through this whole region, it has to move from being positioned at x equals zero over here to being positioned at x equals one over here. So my integral will run from zero to one. So that's going to be two pi integral zero to one three minus x times x to the five dx. And from here, things are easy. This is definitely an integral I could have given you in Calc 1. You distribute the x to the five. So you get 3x to the 5 minus x to the 6, and then apply your power rule. So that'll be 2 pi times. An antiderivative for x to the 5 is x to the 6 over 6. So you have 3 times x to the 6 over 6. The 3 and the 6 play together. And you get x to the 6 over 2 minus power rule on x to the 6 gives me x to the 7 over 7. And this is what gets evaluated between 0 and 1. At 0, both of these are 0. So the only contribution comes from the upper bound, where I get 2 pi times 1 half minus 1 seventh. Which is 2 pi times, my common denominator here would be 2 times 7 is 14. So this would be 7 fourteenths minus 2 fourteenths, 7 minus 2 is 5 fourteenths. And then the 2 and the 14 can play together. I can cancel this 2 into that 14, and I get 5 pi over 7. This would definitely be an exam level problem, right? This would definitely be a problem of the sort you could find on the test. If you remember, you may want to go back and rewatch some of the lecture videos when we talked about these. There is a particular volume problem or type of volume problem that I'd like to put on exam one. And you may want to ready yourself. Um, I'll say just this, make sure you know your graphs, the fundamental ones not just polynomials, but sine, cosine, logs, and exponentials also. Okay, any questions on this guy? Yeah, no problem. I think probably have time for, for a couple more. What is it right now? 8.58. Yeah, time for one or two more. Uh, so Hitanji wanted to see number 11A from homework five and also number 10 from homework five. So let me pop up homework five. Go straight to it. Ten is this, eleven is this. Okay.
10 is another volume problem, so we can take a look at that. Write this down and I'll switch the camera back. In case I don't get time for it, number 11 just wants the PFD setup. So factor the denominator in part A and then set it up. Uh, and then in part B there, you're going to need to long divide. So here is, here is number 10. It's a volume problem, but it's in homework five. So maybe some trig sub is involved. I need to know how to graph nine over X squared plus nine. If you look at the review material in Canvas, I do have a link there, I believe, on graphing rational functions in case you don't remember. Uh, but one over x squared plus one or a over x squared plus a, that's a famous family of curves. Oh, that's nice and big. You know that it has horizontal asymptote y equals zero because the degree of the bottom is two and the degree of the top is one. The only time x shows up anywhere, it is squared. So you know the function is even. And the y-intercept is 0, 9 over 9. That's 0, 1. And that turns out to be a max for this function. This function looks we don't have any intercepts, any x-intercepts. So we end up with Something like this. And classic CALP 1 problem is to find the inflection points. I'll just draw it like this. Y equals 0 again is the x axis, x equals 0 is the y axis. x equals 3, I'll say is like right here. You know, let's move it out a little bit and say this is x equals 3. And I want to revolve this apparatus around the x-axis. So my region is this. In this case, I would say you really should use the disk washer method. You should draw your strip in like this. Because if you draw your strip in like this, you're going to have to split your integral into two pieces. The strip on the right-hand side would be bounded by that curve up to here. But then when you get down here, the strip is bounded by that vertical line. So you would have to handle those two bits separately. So I think the most natural thing to do here is to draw your strip in perpendicular to the axis of rotation and make use of the disk washer method. That also has the advantage of, again, leaving the variable x. I don't have to invert that function, although that wouldn't be terribly hard to do. OK. If I revolve just that strip about that axis, I'll get a little differential solid that looks like a disk. Remember here, my axis of rotation is the x-axis. So do my best to draw this.
something like that. There's no gap between my strip and the axis of rotation. So it's just a disc, not a washer. In other words, little r here is zero. Big R is the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And little r is the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation, so little r is zero. dv for the disk washer method is always pi times cap r squared minus little r squared times either dx or dy. In this case, it's dx because the thickness of that strip is a dx thickness. Little r is zero. What is big R? Yeah, big R in this case is nine over X squared plus nine. It's this function. So the integral I need to do <clears throat> is the integral of dV taken from the smallest x value in my region all the way over to the largest x value in my region, that's from zero to three, which is the integral from zero to three of pi times big R squared. And this we do with a tangent substitution. Because I have this x squared plus 3 squared, I'm going to substitute x equals 3 tan theta. dx is 3 secant squared theta d theta. When x is equal to zero, I have zero equals three tan theta. So theta is the inverse tangent of zero over three. Zero over three is zero though. So theta is the inverse tangent of zero, which is zero. When x is equal to three, theta is the inverse tangent of three over three. Well, 3 over 3 is 1. The inverse tangent of 1 is pi over 4. So we got to remember that inverse trig stuff. And this gets me to integral of 0 to pi over 4. Oh, I forgot to pop out my pi. I'll leave it in here for now. 9 over 3 tan theta squared plus 9 all squared times 3 secant squared theta d theta. which is pi 
integral zero to pi over four, nine over nine tan squared theta plus nine quantity squared times three secant squared theta d theta. Everybody with me so far? I can factor and cancel a nine inside the parentheses. I'll write it out. So downstairs there, I have tan squared plus one, which is secant squared. I'm gonna pop this three out because now I know what's happening with my constants. So I have three pi integral zero to pi over four, one over secant squared theta squared times secant squared theta. which is secant squared over secant to the fourth. And that's three pi integral zero to pi over four. Cancel two of the secants, you get two secants left downstairs one over secant squared is cos squared theta d theta. And from here, the problem isn't bad. You know how to integrate cosine squared. That's a sine cosine integral where the powers are all even. So we need to use half angle identities. So this is three pi over two. Integral zero to pi over four, one plus cos two theta d theta. So my antiderivative step for one, uh, three pi over two, sorry, not four. My antiderivative step, the one will integrate to theta cos two theta will integrate to sine two theta over two. And I evaluate this from zero to pi over four. At zero, everything is zero. At pi over four, I get three pi over two times pi over four plus the sine of two times pi over four is the sine of pi over two divided by two. And the sine of pi over two is one. So this is three pi over two times pi over four plus one half. And I would be perfectly happy with you leaving it like this. Now this problem's a little bit tricky, right? You had to know how to graph nine over x squared plus nine. That's not entirely obvious. You had to know the inverse tangent relationships that were needed to change the bounds. You had to remember your half angle identities to integrate cos squared. 
And then you had to know your unit circle well enough to tell me that the sine of pi over two is one. All of those things would be completely necessary, unavoidable. Uh, this was homework five, problem 10. Okay, I do think that's all we have time for today, guys. So if there are lingering problems that you would like to see worked, I will ask you to come by my office hour. I have my normal office hour this afternoon or send me a Canvas message. I am scrambling to grade exams for one of my other classes right now. Um, so my free time is a little bit limited, but if you wanted to arrange an office hour outside of my normal times, I'll still do my best to do that. The exam is going to be Monday and I will post an announcement this weekend explaining exactly what you need to do for the test. We do not have a class this Friday because Santa Fe calendar committee has got their heads up their asses. So I won't be seeing you guys outside of office hours um, until the test. So if you need to chat, if you're nervous, if there's anything like that going on, please come by an office hour. If you can't come to the regular ones, please try to arrange one. Unfortunately, no, I'm not allowed to, to hold classes on days when the college is closed because this is a hybrid class. I am obligated to follow their schedule. Um, however, I don't have uh, any real plans for this Friday aside from you know grinding on, on shit I need to do. So if you want to schedule an office hour for Friday, I would be willing to do that. Uh, so if that's something you wanna do, email me or Canvas message me uh, and we can make those arrangements. But I won't be holding class and I won't necessarily have my normal office hour on Friday. Um, but everything else will be normal. Watch for that announcement explaining uh, exactly what you need to do for the exam. And then remember on Monday of next week, rather than coming to class, you're going to log into our Canvas uh, course and take the test there. Okay, I wish everybody the best of luck. If you're nervous, please come see me for some help. There is ample opportunity for that between now and the test um, and study hard. Take care guys.